Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of session 6 of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. We have no apologies this morning. We're joined today by Richard Leonard, MSP, and by the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Veterans, Keith Brown, MSP. I, I welcome you both to the meeting. I'd also like to welcome those who have joined us in the public gallery. Our sole agenda item today is Stage 2 consideration of the Miners' Strike Pardons Scotland Bill. Members should have a copy of the marshalled list and groupings for debate with them. I aim to complete our consideration of Stage 2 amendments today. If votes are required today, I will call members to vote yes first and then call for members to vote no and then for any abstentions. <clears throat> Clerks will collate the vote and pass them to me to read out and confirm the results. I will take the stage too slowly so that we have time to manage the process properly. Can I remind the Cabinet Secretary's officials that they cannot speak during this stage but they can communicate with the Cabinet Secretary directly. They can ask all members um, around the table and in the, in the gallery to please make sure any electric, electronic devices are um, on silent mode. Um, so hopefully that's all clear and then we shall make a start with the stage two. At introduction, the presiding officer determined <clears throat> that a financial resolution was not required for this bill. Under Rules 9.12.6c, the presiding officer has determined that the costs associated with Amendment 16 would in themselves exceed the current threshold for a bill to require a financial resolution. Therefore, in terms <clears throat> of Stage 2 proceedings, Amendment 16 may be debated but may not be agreed to in the absence of a financial resolution. That said, I call Amendments 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with the amendments as shown in the groupings, Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, my amendments 1, 4, 6, 7 and 8, when taken together, have the intention to try and broaden eligibility for the pardon to a person convicted for a qualifying offence related to the strike and meeting the other conditions of eligibility who, at the time of such an offence being committed, was a minor or lived in the same household as a minor. And a definition of a minor is already given under Section 4 of the Bill. I should say in doing this and with some of the other amendments, Convener, the attempt is trying to be made to uh, reconcile uh, and uh, address the issues which this committee uh, have raised previously and to stay true to the original spirit of reconciliation which the committee convened by John Scott spoke of. So we've listened to what both his committee and this committee have said. Amendment 1 amends Section 1 of the Bill so that the reference to minor is replaced by the term qualifying individual and this amendment is linked to Amendment 4 which introduces a definition of what is meant by qualifying individual. Amendment 4 is the principal amendment in the group and would broaden eligibility to those close enough to be directly impacted, uh, affected by the strike uh, and its impact on a mining household of which they were part. This means, of course, such as spouses, dependents and other family members. Amendment 6 defines what is meant by household. Household means a group of people living together as a family or other unit whether or not they are related uh, in a private dwelling who share living accommodation and cooking facilities with a minor as currently defined under the bill and where such a dwelling was their only or main residence. Amendment 7 makes a consequential amendment to the definition of minor in section 4 of the bill and Amendment 8 makes a consequential change to the long title of the bill. Ultimately, this set of amendments, as I say, convener in my name, is intended to respond positively to the Stage 1 report recommendation that the Scottish Government should consider extending the range of people who can qualify for the pardon, particularly in relation to family members of minors. I will now go on, if it's OK, convener, to Amendments 4A and 13. So now turning to Pam Duncan Glancy's Amendment 4A, which seeks to amend my own Amendment 4, so that the proposed reference to members of the same household as is replaced by the term family member of. Uh, and amendment 4A is linked to Amendment 13, which introduces a definition of what is meant by family member. And whilst I recognise the intention of the members' amendments given the recommendation by the committee in its Stage 1 report, I do look forward to hearing the members' explanation shortly why it should be uh, the definition that is put forward by her is preferable to the definition which I put forward, which is of a household member. And I do have some concerns around the amendment. 
The definition as proposed by the member requires further consideration, at least given that this would seek to extend eligibility to a considerable number of family members of a minor. And there is, in my view, a risk here that this amendment could have an unintended consequence of diluting the effect of the pardon for minors. And if the committee were to agree to my, my amendment uh, for the immediate members of their households, who were arguably the people most likely to be directly affected by the impact that the strike had on that household. And I would uh, sound a note of caution in the broader formulation of the family connection that the member suggests. Amendment 13 is also not consistent in its treatment of different family members. For example, should sibling include half-sibling and step-sibling? Step-parent would require a legal marriage and would not cover the living partner of a parent. Should step-grandchildren be included? Does cousin mean first cousin or second cousins also? Why is cousin included but not uncle, aunt, niece or nephew? Uh, the Members' Amendment also covers an individual in a civil partnership with a minor, but civil partnerships didn't exist at the time of the strike. Uh, the Members' definition of family member only includes this list, so it isn't clear from the Amendment how much further family member would extend, so perhaps uh, it would be interesting to hear the Members' views uh, if she's able to elaborate on that. Uh, and turning now to the 4B, which seeks to amend uh, uh, for... Well, I've, I've covered, I think, essentially that point. And I do recognise the intention of the Members' Amendments, given the recommendation by the Committee, and look forward to hearing um, the Members' reasoning as to why these amendments are considered to be more appropriate. I note also the definition of supporter only includes the categories of people listed. It's not limited to those groups. And so, again, it could be very hard for an individual to determine just how far eligibility for the pardon would extend if these amendments are accepted. And as I said previously, convener to the committee, there is a real need for clarity so that those that are eligible for the pardon know that they're eligible and it's, it's straightforward and also that it's not uh, diluted to uh, negate its impact uh, for minors. <coughs> And there is a risk, it could be argued a greater risk, that the amendment could have that unintended consequence of diluting uh, the effects of the pardon for minors and those closest to them. So again, I would send a note of caution. And with that, convener, I'm happy to move Amendment 1. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now ask Pam duncan Glancy to speak to Amendment 4A and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener, um, and good morning to the Committee, to the Cabinet Secretary and to all of those um, who have joined us in the gallery today. Um, I, I'll start, I guess, by moving the amendments um, in my name in case I forget at the end. So I move Amendment 4A, 4B, 13 14 in this group. Just to I'll call other amendments uh, later in the, in the proceedings for, for to move or, or not move. But that. Thank you, Convener, for that clarity. I thought it better be belts and braces, um, but thank you very much for that. Um, and I'll cover some of the points that the Cabinet Secretary has raised, um, because a number of those are actually um, very legitimate concerns, and actually um, I'd be willing to work with the Government at Stage 3 to tidy up some of those, providing we could address um, the intention of what I was hoping to do um, with the amendments. Um, the, the strike, uh, as, as is the case for many of us in this room um, today, was a feature in our household. So I was, I was quite young, I think I was about three or four at the time, um, but what it did for minors and their allies was always spoken about in our home um, as an example of workers who were being maltreated and who should not have to fear for, for their livelihoods um, or being criminalised um, just for standing up for workers' rights. So I would have stood in solidarity with them then as I, as I would now. Um, and they, I think we can all agree, were treated awfully. The right to protest, to organise, to rise up and give workers a voice must always be protected, then, now and always. And that's why I stand in solidarity today with those who are striking now, including in colleges, UCUs, um, the RMT and P&O workers. It's also why I spoke up when Glasgow City Council threatened to bring in agency workers when the cleansing workers went on strike. No intimidation of this sort is acceptable. An attack on one... Um, is an attack on us all, and we must always be on the side of workers. And during the committee, we heard compelling evidence from minors, which was incredibly, incredibly moving. Communities were ruined, families and friends turned against one another, pensions were lost, jobs were snatched away illegally. And we also heard evidence from the police, which I have to say and put on record, um, I felt was at odds with the evidence from minors, and I found it hard to reconcile that. So, um, in, in short, we, we, wel we welcome the government's um, intention for this bill. We welcome the pardon and, indeed, the extensions that the Cabinet Secretary's amendments 
um, have, have put forward. And we also welcome the support for things like the Coalfield Re Regeneration Trust, but again, note a number of communities have still not recovered. The amendments in 4A and 4B in my name, so 13, Amendment 13 and Amendment 14 are consequentials and they have definitions in them. Those definitions I would be more than happy to discuss um, in detail because it certainly wasn't an intention to exclude some family members in the way you've, uh, you've described, Cabinet Secretary. So if the definition is something the government would be prepared to work on um, in Stage 3, then I'd be prepared to do that. The reason that, that 4A and 4B I felt were really important is because it is not just the people who lived in the same household who were affected by the, the impacts of what happened to minors at the time. It's also their family and their friends and those who stood in solidarity with them, which is why the, the amendment in, in my name um, seeks, seeks to broaden that definition from not only just the household, but actually other family members and friends who stood in solidarity. If we imagine, and as I said earlier, I was quite young at the time, if I imagine today the way, the way that strikes go, you bring your households at times, but of course you also bring your family and friends, you bring your trade union, um, and you bring those who are standing in solidarity with you. And that was the intention of both um, Amendment 4A and 4B, and in particular, the amendment to include supporters um, of minors, because I think it's incredibly important that workers know that they can have the support of other people standing in solidarity with them in the future and that they too can be pardoned for um, what the, their parts um, and the way that they were treated uh, during the miners' strike. And we had persuasive evidence that the strike was particularly difficult for women, for the wives and daughters of miners, who took on huge responsibilities during the strike. And I think, again, far from diluting the Cabinet Secretary's amendments, I feel that, that my amendments strengthen it in those regards to broaden the, the pardon to those people who too um, had their lives um, completely ruined. So the, the government's amendment, of course, seeks um, to take into account um, what the committee has said, and, and, and we support that um, and welcome it. But, but again, I think that it should be extended to everyone who stood in support of the minors, family or not. Um, and so, convener, colleagues, ultimately, this is about historic injustices, and we need to send a solid message that this sort of treatment of workers should never be tolerated again. And I believe that the amendments in my name do so by broadening um, the scope of who would be pardoned. And I move the, the amendments, potentially not right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll get it. Um, uh, call Fulton McGregor, please. Uh, thanks, convener, and uh, welcome to the the panel and can also welcome the, 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 the people who have come into the public gallery as well. It's good to see folk back in the public gallery after such a long time. And a special shout out. I hope he doesn't mind me saying to Willie Dillon from uh, my constituency who has uh, been a, a, a real figure, a real stalwart for the mining community in, in Auckland Geek and Moody'sburn. I, I welcome this debate um, and, I, and I really welcome the Cabinet Secretary responding to the committee's um, recommendations in, in broadening uh, the, the, the scope of the definition um, and, and who would be a qualifying individual, because I think it's something, as Pam Duncan Glancy said, that we heard quite strong and compelling evidence on that. So I, I'm very much minded to support the government's uh, uh, amendment today, in ter uh, and I think as a as a major step forward in terms of uh, Pam Duncan Glancy's um, uh, amendments as well. I also uh, support the principle uh, of, of those. Um, but I do, I do hear what the Cabinet Secretary said about um, perhaps the difficulties that might be involved in that. So I, I guess just to back up what Pam Duncan Glancy's ask, I think at this stage is, would be if, if the, when the Cabinet Secretary is responding, um, you know, for, for Pam to work with the government getting into stage three, as opposed to possibly moving them uh, today. Um, to, to take them forward into stage three, I think might be a sensible solution. But certainly the uh, the, the amendments that have been proposed by, by Keith Brown today, I think, are, are a, a, a fantastic step forward and definitely add value to the bill. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. Uh, very happy to be involved in this uh, this morning. I think it is important that we understand the scope of the bill. It's quite a small bill, so it doesn't give us uh, a huge amount of opportunity to extend. But I think what the Cabinet Secretary has said with a reference to his amendments 1-4, uh, when we talk about the extension uh, to household families and also the changes to qualifying individuals, uh, these are, are recognised and, and understood, and I, and I would be concurring with the Cabinet Secretary on those. Uh, I think, Pam Duncan Glances, I note what you've said, uh, Pam, but I do believe that there requires further involvement and discussion as to where this can take, and it, it broadens it to a level that maybe doesn't uh, encapsulate. So I think there needs to be more discussion and more dialogue on that. 
uh, going forward into stage three. <clears throat> I also believe that uh, Amendment 6, uh, 7 and 8 uh, that the Keith Byrne has put forward as the Cabinet Secretary once again uh, give us a, a clearing as to where, how we would manage that process. Uh, so uh, at this stage, uh, convener, I, I would be more than content to accept uh, these amendments uh, at, at this stage and then progress the others uh, potentially into the, the next stage of the, the process so that more clarity could be sought and discussed. Thank you. Thank you. And Maggie Chapman. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to everybody. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you for being here. And can I make a special good morning and thank you for coming along to those in, in the gallery today. I would also like to say thank you to all of those who contributed to the work of the committee in, in drafting the Stage 1 report that we, we discussed in, in the Chamber a, a, a few weeks ago. On behalf of the Scottish Greens, Greens, like others have already mentioned, I really welcome the spill. It is a wholehearted welcome, but I suppose one tinge with, with sadness. I wish that the spill had come years ago, and I wish also that the spill covered the whole of the UK and was not Scotland only. And I do hope that other, legislat as other legislatures in, 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 in the UK follow suit. I agree with, with comments that others have, have made around the importance of standing in solidarity with trade unions, with workers, workers on strike, workers seeking to improve conditions for themselves and, and for those who come after them. And I think that this, this bill allows us to not only express that solidarity, but, but also t take stock of where, where things have gone wrong in, in, in the past. And, and I think the, 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 pardon, the pardon is in itself very, very important. On, on the amendment that we are discussing this morning, I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for the work that I know that he's, he's put into this. We, we have pushed him in, in, into, into some of these amendments uh, as a committee, and, and I think that, that shows that th this, this has been a really, really good, really positive, really constructive discussion, and I, I, I thank him for those amendments. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to support the, the amendments in, in the Cabinet Secretary's name today. I, I, I thank Pam Duncan Glancy for, for, the, for what she said about hers, and I hope that over the next few weeks we, we can talk about how, how we incorporate uh, the, the spirit of, of what you are trying to achieve in, in, that, um, in, in, in those amendments at, at stage three. But th th this morning I'll be supporting the, the Cabinet Secretary's amendments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And if I can now ask the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Just to uh, endorse some of the comments that have been made, not least uh, by... Um, uh, Pam Duncan Glancy, that uh, I, I think she's right in the, the way she talks about the strike. Uh, for my own part, uh, I wasn't on the picket line, but I did support the strike as a student by the various means which students tend to support these things. Uh, for those that have done that, uh, I do represent a constituency which has got very substantial numbers of ex-miners uh, in it. In fact, some of the most recent ex-miners, because it includes Long Gannett, uh, or just outside is Long Gannett, where many people are employed from my constituency. It's also true um, I was on strike myself in the 1980s in a different context, and I very much value the solidarity that we had from other trade unions and other people at the time. So, of course, I'm very alive um, to that. Uh, and also, I don't think there's any intention on the part of uh, Pam Duncan Glancy to try and dilute this. I do think that is the effect of these amendments, but I know that's not her intention. Uh, so, convener, I've always believed that it was the miners themselves who were the most disproportionately affected by the stigma and the often unforeseen consequences of being convicted. And it's therefore appropriate, in my view, that it's the miners who should feel pardoned if they consider that the eligibility criteria be met. That also applies, in my view, to the loved ones of those miners, sadly no longer with us, uh, who could be pardoned uh, posthumously. I have extended, as uh, Michael Chapman says, the, the categories of people listen to what the committee have had to say. I do believe to extend it in the way that's proposed would start to dilute it and brings in de degrees of ambiguity which would uh, create uncertainty in the minds, or it may create uncertainty in the minds who are eligible for this pardon. Um, it's been mentioned on a number of occasions that there is a lack of surviving records given the passage of time. Uh, there are contesting views and accounts on the events which happened during the strike, as the committee indeed know by hearing very powerful testimonies of those who provided both oral and written evidence at stage one. The report of the independent review group itself recommended a pardon for the men convicted, and there is no robust evidence to suggest that any women or young people were convicted. 
I therefore recognise there will always be a degree of uncertainty as to how many individuals living in the same household as a minor were convicted during the strike. But my amendments seek to broaden eligibility to those individuals should they consider they meet the qualifying criteria for the pardon and in so doing seek to address one of the concerns which this committee raised with me. I therefore trust that the committee recognises in my own amendments a genuine attempt to broaden eligibility to those who lived in the same household as a minor, close enough to be directly impacted uh, by the strike, uh, and who were convicted for actions they took as a result of that impact. The proposed amendments 4A and 13 highlight the challenge that exists in drafting a definition of family member that works in the context of the strike. I am willing to consider this further. However, I can't support these amendments in their current form format, uh, and I therefore ask the member not to press amendments 4A and 13 at this time. And I also think that amendments 4B and 14 require further careful consideration, and I undertake to give those further careful consideration, uh, particularly to clarify and set boundaries on the relationships which are covered by the term supporter. But at this stage and in their current format, I can't support uh, these amendments, and I would therefore ask the member not to press amendments 4B and 14 at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, we now move to the question. The question is, amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay, that is agreed. That then takes us on to the second group on qualifying conduct. And I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with the amendments as shown in the groupings. <clears throat> Please note the procedural information in relation to this group um, as contained in the groupings. Amendment 3 preempts Amendment 9, 10, 11, 15 and 12. Therefore, I cannot call Amendments 9, 10, 11, 15 or 12 if Amendment 3 is agreed. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thanks again, Convener. My amendments 2 and 3 respond again to the Committee's recommendation that the pardon is extended to offences which occurred in the community rather than only in the context of a picket demonstration or similar gathering. Theft is added to the list of qualifying offences by Amendment 5 and an additional eligibility criterion is created for this offence. Amendment 3 amends Section 1 of the Bill by removing existing conditions A and B, and this gets quite complex, and apologies for that, a, a convener. Uh, it removes existing conditions A and B and replaces them with differently worded conditions A and B and a new condition C. Replacement condition A broadens the scope of where and the context in which qualifying offences may have taken place under this condition by providing that the conduct which gave rise to such an offence must have occurred whilst an individual was engaged or participating in activity, including activity which is ancillary, such as connected travel, either in support or opposition to the minor strike. This replaces the narrower current reference to a picket demonstration or similar gathering. Replacement Condition A also specifies that any activity which occurred for a reason unrelated to the minor strike, for example a personal matter, is excluded from the scope of the pardon. Replacement Condition B provides that conduct which occurred in response to conduct which meets Condition A, if you can follow that convener, well done, uh, is also included within the scope of the pardon. This is intended to cover both parties to an altercation in the community where, for example, strike-related abusive comments made by one party are responded to with more general threats or insults by another. Replacement Condition B also specifies that any activity which occurred for a reason unrelated to the minor strike, for example, a personal matter, is excluded from the scope of the pardon. Amendment 3 also introduces new condition C, where conduct which gave rise to the offence of theft is covered by the pardon if it occurred because of economic hardship arising from participation, whether by the individual or another person, in the minor strike. And the economic hardship referred to in condition C could have been either the hardship suffered by the person convicted of the theft or the hardship of another person which was to be relieved by the item which was stolen. For example, a member of a striking minor's household who stole an item in order to relieve the hardship of another member of the household. Amendment 2 amends Section 1 of the Bill so that Condition A or Condition B applies only to the qualifying offences of breach of the peace, an offence under Section 3 of the Bail etc. Scotland Act 1980, breach of bail conditions, and an offence under Section 41 1A of the Police Scotland Act 1967, obstructing police etc. It also amends Section 1 of the Bill so that Condition C applies only to the qualifying offence of theft. 
This is required because theft is not activity supporting or opposing the strike or a direct response to such activity, and therefore this offence needs a separate criterion. Ultimately, this set of amendments in my name seek to respond positively to the Stage 1 report recommendation that the Scottish Government should consider extending the pardon to convictions for qualifying offences that occurred in mining communities. Uh, and turning now to Pam Duncan Glancy's Amendment 3A, which seeks to replace the reference to supporting or opposing proposed in my Amendment 3 with a broader reference to relating to the strike. And I'm not sure what the basis is for considering that, working to be pref that, that wording to be preferable to the one which I propose, but I do look forward to hearing that explanation. I would sound a note of caution in that the broader formulation of wording that suggested by uh, Pam Duncan Glance's amendments suggests, uh, in my view, is rather vague and it might create uncertainty. And in turn, this uncertainty could make it harder for people to self-assess whether they qualify for the pardon. And turning now, convener briefly to amendments 9, 10, 11 and 12 proposed by Alexander Stewart. Taken together, as you've suggested, uh, convener, these amendments seek to remove all references to other similar gatherings from section 1 of the bill. But given that my amendment 3 will remove this wording from the bill, I consider these amendments are unnecessary. And in a similar vein, amendment 15 proposed by Pam Gozel seeks to remove the references to intended participation or in section uh, intended participation or in section 13b of the bill and again my amendment 3 would remove this wording and turning now to richard leonard's amendment 17 which amends section 2 of the bill to introduce section 7 of the conspiracy and protection of property act 1875 as a qualifying offence uh, i fully recognize the members wish to include in the pardon an offence which some would argue is not dissimilar to the sort of conduct associated with a breach of the peace I do continue to have, however, some concerns about the proposal, given the violence and intimidation aspects which are mentioned in the 1875 Act. A conviction under that Act could cover a wide spectrum of behaviour relating to attempting without legal authority to compel another person to support the strike or not to go to work. For example, the use of violence to intimidate another person or their family or damaging their property. I am willing to consider uh, this further. I am happy also to discuss directly with the member uh, uh, the wording uh, and the basis for this amendment. Uh, I should say that uh, further anecdotal evidence indicates there were 16 convictions for this offence, all of them in Strathclyde, with a maximum fine of £50. However, for today, convener, I would urge members to carefully consider whether such behaviour might cross the line between supporting industrial action and intimidating a minor who chose to work or even that minor's family. But I am willing, as I say, to have further discussions with the member on this. And with that, convener, I move amendment to my name. Thank you. I now call Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to amendment 3A and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, and I'll, I'll start with Amendment 3A, which is, is of course, the amendment in my name. Um, we are very happy to support measures in the Bill that broaden the scope of it, um, and in particular the offences um, covered by it. However, we believe that including offences committed by those who opposed the strike on the face of the Bill sends the wrong message and may even go against the spirit of the proposed legislation. So we prefer the wording related to, to recognise that this is what we are trying to do, to support minors, not necessarily people who were opposed. Um, and we feel that it tidies the bill up in, in this regard and is more in the spirit of what the bill is intended to do. So we're more comfortable with the phrasing of related to as opposed to supporting or opposing for those reasons. Um, on Amendment 17 in my colleague Richard Leonard's name, um, the, uh, we welcome the, the fact that the government has um, extended the convictions to, to include theft. Um, and we believe that um, Amendment 17 would reinforce the government's extensions on this. And also um, that this particular amendment um, covers offences that are more related specifically to offences that happened um, in industrial action. And so we think it relates directly to what this bill is seeking to do. On Amendments 9, 10, 11, 15 and 12, um, as, as they narrow the scope of the bill further, um, we would not be able to support those amendments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now call Alexander Stewart, please. To speak to members and other members in the group. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, convener. Uh, amendment 9 uh, in my name looks at the wording of the bill and introduced, and as has been indicated, the vagueness of the, the lack of specifics when it comes to the area of similar gatherings uh, is imprecise and would lead minors and their families to mistakenly believe that they have been pardoned 
for participating in events which are not covered by the bill, uh, nor intended. So, and 10, 11 and 12 are of very similar nature, uh, uh, convener. If I can speak on other amendments within the bill, uh, Amendment 2 in the name of Keith Brown does clarify that theft meets the new conditions under C uh, and is introduced uh, by Amendment 3. Amendment 3 itself, this amendment improves the clarity around who will be pardoned. This also widens the scope of the pardon and will offer a, a, a number of individuals. Pam Duncan glances 3A, this slightly changes the drafting of Amendment 3. It appears to be slightly improving the draft and we will accept that. Uh, amendment 17 under the name of Richard Leonard, this amendment looks at offences under Section 7 which involves violence and intimidation and damage to property. Uh, unhappy and concerned about the, the process within that. Uh, and I would be seeking to see more clarity on that. And maybe when Mr. L Mr. Leonard speaks on this, he may give us that. But at this stage, uh, are, are a little bit sensitive as to how that would manage within this process. Uh, so I uh, look forward to hearing what the, the member says. Amendment 5 uh, works with the previous amendments to uh, in include theft as a qualifying offence if committed as a result of economic hardship due to unfair fair conditions. A convener. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I ask Pam Gossel to speak to Amendment 15 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'll support the amendments of 2, 3 and 5 in the, say, uh, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. These amendments improve clarity around who will receive a pardon and when the scope of the pardon are appropriately, even if this is only likely to affect a small number of people. The bill, as introduced, includes some ambiguous around the qualifying conduct. I therefore proposed Amendment 15, which alongside Amendments 9, 10 and 11 in the name of my colleague Alexandra Stewart, would have removed some of the potential for the bill to be misinterpreted, which could have resulted in an individual mistakenly believing that they have received a pardon. The improved drafting introduced by Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary also achieves this goal, so I'm happy to support this regardless of the preemption and causes to any of the men in this group. Thank you. Can I ask Richard Leonard to speak to Amendment 17 and other amendments in the group? Um, thank you, Convener, and uh, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to move uh, this amendment this morning. And can I also welcome those who have joined us in the public gallery because we are in the end a people's parliament and we need to listen to and reflect the views of the people that send us here. Um, I'm moving uh, Amendment 17, uh, which seeks to add to those pardoned, uh, those minors convicted of an offence under Section 7 of the Conspiracy and Protection of Property Act 1875, uh, which uh, reminds us that this is quite an archaic law. It's a law from Victorian times that goes back to the days when the Prime Minister was Benjamin uh, Disraeli, and actually it was brought in following a gas workers' strike in 1872. Uh, uh, and its intent at the time was to remove the criminal law and the crime of conspiracy uh, from uh, employment relations. The truth of the matter is that it was very, very rarely used uh, in the 20th century. Uh, one of the most um, notorious occasions uh, when it was used uh, was in connection with the Shrewsbury pickets in 1973, uh, which included people like Desi Warren and uh, Ricky Tomlinson, uh, who just last year uh, saw their criminal convictions overturned uh, in the Royal Courts uh, of Justice, uh, which is uh, one of the reasons why many people think that this is quite a discredited piece uh, of legislation. What this amendment I'm moving this morning uh, attempts to do is therefore... Uh, to iron out a wrinkle in the legislation, it's to improve uh, the legislation. But it is also, and I'm quite clear about this, to tackle uh, an inequality, uh, an injustice, uh, and a form of discrimination which appears to have been uh, at work because it was only minors living in the Strathclyde area uh, who were ever convicted uh, under this piece uh, of legislation. As the Cabinet Secretary has said, uh, according to the best records we've got, uh, 16 people uh, were, were charged uh, with the offence in Strathclyde and the maximum fine they received was £50, uh, which suggests um, it didn't 
uh, include uh, the kind of acts of violence uh, that have been uh, referred to. And the, the activities uh, that people were involved in uh, who were charged uh, under, these uh, um, um, under this legislation uh, would elsewhere, in Fife, in Clackmanshire, in the Lothians, would have been convicted under breach of the peace, for which pardons, as a result of this legislation, will be granted. It covers uh, public offences uh, in the same way as breach of the peace uh, does. It's a statutory form uh, of breach of the peace, uh, and it is uh, equivalent. And um, reference has been uh, made to the language in the 1875 Act. If you look at the Public Order Act, Section 14, it talks of the police being given the right to disperse, disperse crowds if intimidation of others with a view to compelling them not to do an act uh, they have a right to do or to do an act that they have a right not to do. So that word compelling is contained in both pieces of legislation. My concern would be that um, if you were charged under one act uh, in Strathclyde, you would not be covered by the pardon. If you were charged uh, with an equivalent uh, act in another part of Scotland, uh, you would be covered uh, by uh, the pardon. And I think uh, we are all attempting to make sure that this legislation, under some difficult circumstances, because it relates to events that happened uh, 37 and 38 years ago uh, is the best that we can make it. So um, uh, I am uh, uh, clear that uh, this is something which uh, needs to be incorporated in, in, in the Act uh, because, in my view, it, it would be irrational and unjust not to include it. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Fulton McGregor, please. Uh, thanks, Convener. Just to, um, again, welcome the... Um, the amendments that have been brought forward, um, particularly from the uh, from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think that these, again, are uh, reflecting what, what the committee heard in, in expanding um, the, the types of crimes. I think is the, the, it's good to see that the Government and the Cabinet Secretary have listened to what the committee have said. Um, I want to uh, pay special note to um, the introduction of new Condition C, which I think uh, is brings real additional value to the legislation because one of the things that we did here was the financial impact on mining families, miners and of course communities and, and again if, if, if Willie doesn't mind me saying um, Moody's Burn is, is still an example of that um, where the, the community has not fully recovered yet. So to actually see that you know that, that you know an individual who perhaps committed a, a financial crime to leave financial suffering is now included in this as, as I think is a uh, is an absolutely um, fantastic move forward and uh, I'll, I'll certainly be supporting that and all the amendments in the in the government's name I know that some of the other amendments uh, put forward by Alexander and uh, Pam Gossel um, you know are, are likely to be superseded by the uh, by, by government amendments um, you know that, so I think that the clarity has already been given there by the by the government. I also want to say, in terms of Richard Leonard's amendment 17, um, I think that it, it, I, I've actually got a lot of sympathy with that as well, based on what he said there. Uh, my constituency would have also previously been covered by the old Strathclyde region, so again, it's uh, it, it, it's it seems strange and odd that only people in Strathclyde would have been convicted of this offence. But I also hear what the the cabinet secretary said, and he's made a very clear offer to the member to, uh, to to sit down and work with him ahead of stage three. And when he was making that offer, I did see Richard uh, nodding his head as well. So I think that that, to me, seems a sensible solution to be get a bit more clarity on that. But, you know, if it's only folk in Strathclyde that have been convicted of those offences, I'm not happy either. I know that the Cabinet Secretary won't be. Thanks. Thank you. And if I can move to the Cabinet Secretary to wind up on the group. Hey, thank you very much again, Convener. Um, I should say that uh, when we first proposed this uh, bill, it went further than John Scott's committee had recommended in a number of respects. And of course, at this stage, we're going further um, than this committee suggested in a number of respects, but having taken into account the committee's view. I do think there have to be limits to it because I think we start to devalue the, the impact of the pardon. Um, but I would hope that the committee would recognise 
In my amendments two and three, a genuine attempt to broaden eligibility in a way that is relatively easy for people to understand and also in a way that does not dilute the value of the pardon. Now, I can say that and it can sound a fairly abstract thing. I do not think it is to those minors or the families of minors who will get the pardon. I think they want to know that it has a value that they can identify. Um, I have tried to meet the issues which um, the committee is concerned about. Amendment 5, I should say, recognised that the offence of theft, of which I understand there were only three convictions, was an act of desperation for people who were very hard-pressed during the strike. Uh, we have changed their view on this. I think it may have been, I can't say for certain, three women, all in Ayrshire, uh, involved in this. Um, I can't say because the records aren't there, but it's not hard to imagine this could have been through economic hardship to look after families, and that's why we have changed uh, our view on that. As I have said, I can't support Amendment 3A in its current format, as I believe it would uh, introduce uncertainty. My own Amendment 3 makes clear the context of the purpose of the activity a person was engaged in, participating in or responding to during the minor strike, uh, and personal matters are expressly excluded. I, I know Pam Duncan Glancy's point about being in support of the strike, but we have discussed this with the NUM and others who are perfectly comfortable with what we propose. So somebody that is against the strike has to be covered for the same behaviours for those that were for the strike. I think if we were to have any real attempt at reconciliation, which I think Pam Duncan Glancy said in her first contribution was a hard thing to do, the reconciliation, I think we have to do that. And the NUM are perfectly comfortable uh, with that, for example. Uh, I listen to the member's explanation, feel there is merit in giving it further consideration, but it requires further work ahead of stage three. So I would ask for that amendment not to be pressed. That's 3A at this time. For the reasons set out previously, I would ask Alexander Stewart to withdraw his amendments 9, 10, 11 and 12 if my own amendment 3 is agreed, and I think you have said to be preempted in any event, uh, convener. Uh, and for similar reasons, I would ask Pam Gosell to withdraw her amendment 15. I think she has conceded that point as well, if it is if it's, um, superseded. Uh, I do continue to have some concerns about Richard Leonard's amendment 17, given the aspects pertaining to the use of violence and intimidation, which are mentioned in the 1875 Act. I suppose I'm less concerned whether it was Benjamin Desrilly that brought in the Act as to what actually happened at the time. But maybe to give a little bit of comfort to Alexander Stewart, I think if you look at the maximum fine of £50, um, that gives you some indication of the level of offence, especially if you compare it to breaches of the priests uh, and breaches of bail conditions. So that seems to suggest that the offences were not as serious as might be construed under this Act. But I think that requires a bit of further work. Um, and I, I do think, uh, in relation to uh, Richard Leonard's view myself, I don't actually think we're that far apart in that, and I don't think there'll be too much difficulty uh, in coming to some agreement. So I would ask the member to accept uh, uh, at face value my offer to discuss this in good faith and not to press Amendment 17 at this time. OK, thank you. Um, we now move to the question. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? OK, that is agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 2. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move. Thank you. I uh, point, point out again that if Amendment 3 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 9, 10, 11, 15 or 12, as they will have been preempted. I now call Amendment 3A in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy already, already debated with Amendment 2. Pam Duncan Glancy to move formally. Yes, moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 3A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. No, that's not agreed. Amendment 3A. So can we now go to a vote? Um, those in favour of Amendment 3A, please show. That's uh, three votes. OK, and those against? Four votes. Amendment 3A has not been agreed to. We therefore move to um, well to ask the, sorry move to question Amendment 3A3, um, which has already been moved by the Cabinet Secretary. Are we all agreed? Amendment 3. Yep, that is that is agreed. We therefore um, move on um, to agree section one. So the question is that section one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Thank you. So I call <clears throat> Amendment 4 in the name of Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. I call Amendment 4A in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 1. 
Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 4A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is not agreed. So I now call... Sorry. So those in favour of Amendment 4A. One vote and those against. That is not agreed. I call Amendment 4B in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 1. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Moved. Moved. So the question is Amendment 4B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is not agreed. Um, all those in favour? One vote in favour. All those against? And that is six votes against. So that is therefore not agreed. Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw Amendment 4 as... Press, move. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. So we now move on to Group 3 on in relation to compensation scheme. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Richard Leonard, grouped with Amendment 18. I remind members that under Rule 9.12.6c, the presiding officer has determined that the costs associated with Amendment 16 would in themselves be significant. Therefore, Amendment 16 may be debated, but the question on it will not be put in the absence of a financial resolution. Richard Leonard, to move Amendment 16 and speak to both amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. And um, uh, I'm pleased to speak this morning to uh, Amendment 16, uh, Compensation Scheme. Uh, which seeks to establish a compensation scheme or schemes uh, to make some financial redress uh, to those people uh, pardoned uh, by the uh, bill uh, when it becomes an act. Um, it's been suggested to me that the scheme uh, could cover uh, those arrested not charged, could cover those arrested and charged, could cover those arrested and charged and convicted, those arrested and charged and convicted and dismissed. The uh, legislation as it stands uh, refers to those people being pardoned who were convicted, uh, of, of course. But the Scott Review uh, points out that uh, uh, the estimates, uh, the best estimates that we've got is that uh, 1,400 uh, uh, minors were arrested uh, between March 84 and March 85, that around 500 minors uh, were convicted, uh, and uh, we know that 206 minors were sacked as a result uh, of those uh, convictions. Um, uh, some of those um, affected uh, because of the passage of time are now deceased, uh, which is why in the amendment uh, it's proposed that there should be a legal representative or an executor, uh, maybe a next of kin, um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, who would be eligible for um, uh, financial redress under a compensation scheme or schemes. Uh, the truth of the matter is that many of those who have uh, died uh, uh, died w without a will uh, and uh, that's why there are some uh, issues around the need for legal representation uh, uh, to be uh, required. Um, the amendment also calls for the rules of a scheme uh, to be uh, laid before uh, the Parliament. I just want to um, uh, go back to why I think uh, this is important. Um, and remind uh, people uh, why we are here and considering uh, this legislation uh, this morning. Um, today is the 10th of May, uh, and on this day um, in 1984, 290 miners, uh, eight coach loads, were stopped on the A80 at Steps by Strathclyde Police. Uh, they were charged under Section 17 and 41 of the Police Act, charged with breach of the peace, fingerprinted, photographed, held in police custody, which is a salutary reminder uh, that many of those held in uh, police stations across Glasgow had never set foot in a police station before, never mind being incarcerated in a cell, uh, and many of them uh, never stepped foot in a police station uh, afterwards. This was an extraordinary event uh, and an extraordinary uh, act uh, by Strathclyde uh, Police at that time. Uh, many of us have heard um, the harrowing story, story of uh, Doddy McShane. Uh, Doddy uh, took the rap for a broken window, uh, a crime which he did not commit. 
uh, as a result, he lost his job. Uh, but more than that, uh, the late Doddy's son, uh, James, uh, has testified about visiting his father in jail in Sockton as a result of that um, charge. And uh, he movingly tells us that his father was in jail uh, sharing a cell with someone from armed robbery and someone in there for uh, attempted murder. And the family uh, and, f and friends of uh, Doddy McShane are with us uh, this morning. Uh, also with us this morning is Jim Tierney, uh, who was on that bus or one of those buses in Steps uh, 38 years ago today, uh, but later spent 26 days and nights uh, in Barlini and was later uh, sacked uh, and blacklisted. Um, the Scott Report, which is the genesis of this legislation, points out that what sets these cases apart, in our view, is the disproportionality of cumulative impacts caused by dismissal following on from dealings with some aspect of the justice system, especially convictions. Uh, the Scott Report goes on to say, no one has suggested to us that dismissal was an appropriate, reasonable or measured response to what were commonly relatively minor acts of public disorder punished by modest financial penalties uh, imposed uh, by a court. At the weekend, uh, Mick McGarry's son, himself a striking minor, uh, who was arrested repeatedly and sacked, said this. He said, the minors and their families, the women and children who bore the brunt of what happened, had their future stolen from them. It is only right that they are compensated for that. What was done to those men was one of the worst injustices in Scottish history. Members of, the, uh, of this committee and uh, other members of the Scottish Parliament will have received a communication from the National Union of Mine Workers and the Cabinet Secretary has this morning uh, referred to uh, discussions and uh, constructive dialogue that he has had with the National uh, Union of Mine Workers. Well, this is what the NUM uh, is saying about uh, a compensation scheme. A letter by uh, Nicky Wilson, the national president of the National Union of Mine Workers, uh, says this in plain terms. The NUM wants to see compensation paid to miners across the UK. We believe that this bill provides a historic opportunity for Scotland to lead the way by including a compensation scheme for those miners and we will continue to advocate for a public inquiry. He goes on, time is of the essence. Many miners have passed away and time is running out for others who were convicted. We understand the Scottish Government wishes to pass the bill to enact, to enact the pardon and is concerned that including a compensation scheme may delay this. But the pandemic has demonstrated the speed with which legislation can be enacted when the issue is afforded priority. We believe this is the time for priority to be given to these, to these historic wrongs, including a clause in the legislation in support of the establishment of a compensation scheme, which would cause no delay and indicate the government's intention uh, to act uh, in this area. The Cabinet Secretary at the end of his opening remarks in moving the general principles of the bill at stage one said, as a society, we want to pardon those convictions. In that way, we are recognising the hardship and suffering of entire communities and bringing some comfort and reconciliation uh, to the many who were involved. Recognising the hardship and suffering demands action and not just a symbolic pardon. So what I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to do is to come forward uh, with a financial resolution in time for the Stage 3 debate uh, of this bill. He knows, and members of the committee know, that it is only he that can do that. So I call on him this morning in front of this committee to, to give an undertaking that he will do that, that he will work with me, will work with the National Union of Mine Workers and others uh, to make sure that Parliament gets a vote on what is seen by many as an otherwise glaring omission from this important piece of legislation. Okay, um, Fulton McGregor. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to speak on uh, this amendment put forward by, by Richard Leonard. I think at, at the outset, I would like to say that um, I think there's two broad issues here. There's the bill itself, and there's the support of compensation. And I think it's very, very important, at least for me, uh, but I'm sure also my colleagues, given the evidence that we heard, that we don't conflate these two issues at, at this point. And what I mean by that is to say that um, I, I want to leave uh, people who are in the gallery, people who may be watching, in absolutely no doubt whatsoever that I, and I believe I speak for many of my colleagues here, although they're obviously free to speak for themselves, fully support the minors should be compensated for the wrongs they endured. I met a group of minors uh, at Moody's Burn uh, just last Wednesday night. And, you know, it was harrowing to hear the, the, uh, what they had experienced and what their families had experienced since uh, losing jobs, not having a, a financial income for a long period of time. I don't think that anybody, anybody with a conscience would not support these people being compensated. But that is not the issue here. Now, I know that Richard does not... Uh, Richard Leonard, uh, apologies, is not uh, a, a member of this committee. But this committee looked at the evidence around compensation a lot. It came up in almost every evidence session. I see the, the convener uh, nodding his head. All of us asked questions around it. We tried to see how it might work. And we've come to the conclusion, as, you'll see, uh, as uh, people have seen from the report, that this bill is not the place to do it. There's a number of risks attached to it. One is that it could delay the bill for a significant period of time. Um, it's not the, the main purpose of the bill. And the, the, the issue of compensation in itself brings about a whole new you know, legislative, legislative type framework. So I, I think that um, you know, we're, we're at the, the, the space just now where the pardon is, is what we're talking about. Um, now, what I would want to say to the Cabinet Secretary, and the Cabinet Secretary will be responding to Richard Leonard, I do think we need to be looking at what we can do to make compensation happen, if this is via the UK Government, or if it's something following this bill that the Scottish Government can do, what campaigns, what processes can we be involved in. And what I wanted to ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary in uh, is summing up if he would agree to meet with me to, to discuss how this might be moved forward. Uh, in, in that way. Now, I think even even the, in terms of the, we're debating this today, but we're not going to get to vote on it, uh, convener actually dem should demonstrate to anybody watching the the difficulties and complications with this part of it that, that you know, my colleague Richard Leonard has brought forward a motion, uh, an amendment, sorry, uh, to, to stage two today, and the presiding officer has looked at it and deemed that it's not you know, it's not appropriate to take it forward at this stage because the financial aspects of it through the financial resolution have not been considered. So that in itself should demonstrate how the committee have wrangled with this issue. But I want to be very clear that, you know, there's two separate issues here. There's a bill, which is a bill to pardon minors for the, the wrongs that they endured, and there's the, uh, the compensation issue. And, and I don't want it to be conflated that, you know, well, well we're not voting on it today anyway, but that you know, by it not moving forward today, that, that certainly myself and I'm sure other members eh, are not supporting or not supportive of compensation. And I would like to explore with the Cabinet Secretary eh, how we might go about achieving this. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. I recognise why this amendment has been submitted. Uh, and it's in good faith, I have no doubt. But it does attempt to introduce compensation scheme which is not the purpose of the bill and would only delay its implementation uh, and for those reasons I would feel unhappy to accept it at this stage. I understand uh, the financial resolutions and the significance that that would impart uh, but I also recognise that this is a UK wide issue uh, and that it is that at the UK wide issue that it should be addressed. If compensation is to be addressed it should be addressed as a UK wide issue and not through this bill at this stage. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. And if I can call Pam Duncan-Glancy, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, 
I want to speak in support of, of this amendment, and I do understand that it isn't going to go to a vote today, but I would reiterate my colleague Richard Leonard's calls to the Cabinet Secretary to produce a financial resolution ahead of Stage 3. Because whilst my colleague Fulton McGregor notes that the presiding officer has said that we cannot vote on this amendment today, the presiding officer didn't say that this bill wasn't the place to include compensation. The presiding officer said that because there wasn't a financial resolution, we couldn't do it. The reason there isn't a financial resolution is not because the bill isn't competent to consider that, it's because the government didn't produce one. Um, and the government didn't produce one because they've said up until now that financial compensation would be the, um, the responsibility of a different government. I, I honestly think that this is an example of um, putting our money where our mouth is. If we think that this parliament can offer the pardon to minors that they deserve, then we also must agree that it has the competency to pay them compensation. Because if it doesn't have the competency to do that, what competency does it have for the pardon? And I think that the two um, must go together. I don't want to delay this bill. I know that um, the time is uh, of the essence with it, but I would, I would reiterate my colleague Richard Leonard's points about the speed at which legislation can be brought through um, and progressed uh, when, when the government uh, want, wants to do so. Um, and we've shown that during the COVID pandemic. We've seen it um, in various other examples, the um, Carers Alliance Supplement Bill being one. Um, so there are there are examples of how we can do this, and so I would urge the government to really reconsider doing so. And finally, on on my colleague Alexander uh, Stewart's uh, comments about this um, being being for the UK government, um, I I would love to see more minors pardoned, um, and and therefore um, this have other due restrictions. But this is a bill of the Scottish Parliament, um, and it's a bill um, to to recognise the injustice that minors felt then. Um, the, the injustice was at the hands of, as we know, uh, the police, the sheriffs, the justice system, and otherwise, all of which um, were separate um, legal systems in Scotland at the time for which the Scottish Parliament assumed responsibility after. And so I don't think it is sufficient to say that this Parliament doesn't have the competency to do so. And so I would urge the government um, to, to seriously please consider um, the, the, the financial resolution that would be required so that at least if they don't necessarily believe that compensation should be put forward, and I, I think colleagues do actually, um, but if they don't um, believe that it, that it should be at this point, that Parliament can make that decision for itself at stage three. Thank you. Thank you. And can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Hey, thanks, Convener. And just in case I forget, can I say I'm more than happy to meet um, with the member um, to discuss this uh, post uh, the bill and indeed with other members that may be interested in seeing how we can uh, better prosecute the case for compensation from the UK government. I hope in doing that and having that discussion, it will be possible for us to try and reach some kind of consensus and unanimity. I think it is, in my view, really important to the former miners I've spoken to that the Parliament does speak with one voice in relation to this, even if we appear to have a difference of opinion here. And I'll do what I can to explain why I have the view I have. First of all, I do recognise that many minors and their families suffered terrible hardship as a result of taking part in the strike, and not just that, but they, even now, many have not recovered, for those that are still living, not recovered from the effects of that strike. Indeed, their subsequent generations have not recovered from the effect uh, of that strike, either on their families or their communities. So I understand that point, and I think it's absolutely right that compensation uh, is paid uh, in relation to that. I'll explain the reasons why I think this bill uh, is not uh, the right place to do that, though. Um, and I would say that it's not for some of the reasons which have been mentioned. I don't think I've advanced some of those reasons which have been mentioned. So I agree that it should be paid. The bill is not the place, and it's not just my view. That's the view of this committee. That's the view of John Scott's review as well. He was for uh, a, a pardon which would provide reconciliation, would be automatic, would be as easy as possible uh, for people to assume. And you do complicate that if you try to graft in, at a late stage, a compensation scheme. It's not so much, I think, as members have said, about the time it would take to bring legislation. It is both the time it would take to actually put together a proper compensation scheme and also the effect it would have on people getting the pardons to which I think they should be uh, entitled. So... Obviously, the uh, amendment seeks that some form of compensation be made by the Scottish Government to minors who qualify for the pardon. It doesn't specify, and I've got to speak to the amendment, although it's not been uh, voted on today, that's what's in front of us. It doesn't specify what's being compensated for, nor does it specify an amount to be paid or the basis of calculating such an amount. Uh, therefore, I do have concerns about the lack of specificity in the proposed provisions, but I've got other concerns as well. It doesn't provide the means to compensate minors for the hardships they endured in a financial sense. The pardon, uh, this bill, the whole point of this bill, 
uh, is a symbolic, collective and automatic pardon and focused on reconciliation rather than compensation. That's not to say that compensation is wrong, just that this is not the place for it. You will undermine the fact that it's symbolic, that it's collective, because as I'll go on to explain, it will divide minor from minor, who qualifies, who doesn't, uh, and it will not be automatic. A compensation scheme would not be consistent with the pro proposal to self-assess eligibility for the pardon. That's what we're asking people to do, to look at what this Parliament passes and say, I'm entitled to that pardon and I should get it. This would undermine that. And it would have the potential to create significant practical differences. As the committee highlighted in its Stage 1 report, it would be complex to administer. If anybody can point me to a scheme, compensation scheme this Parliament's approved, which is not complex to administer, doesn't require a substantial bureaucracy, it doesn't require an application process, and I'd be happy to listen to that. We would require qualified people to assess whether applicants did actually qualify for the pardon. As we know, the evidence for a conviction, and under the circumstances prescribed in the Bill, it will be diff difficult for applicants to find um, that evidence, given the passage of time. And that's why the Bill does not propose an application scheme for the pardon, because you know how difficult that would be. Instead, it's for the individual to self-assess. Uh, Richard Leonard mentioned the NUM. I said that I had reached agreement with the NUM or they were in agreement with our proposal in relation to a previous amendment. I made no mention on the compensation scheme. We had a very cordial discussion. I've known Nicky Wilson for many years. It's a straightforward concession. We have different points of view. He did make the point to me, since it's been asked, that why was this pardon and compensation not approved during 13 years of a Labour government? Why was the Miners' Pension Fund taken, lost billions of pounds at the hands of successive governments who hoovered that money that belonged to the Miners' Pension Fund? These things can't be addressed uh, in this bill as well. If the committee were to support Richard Leonard's proposal, then only minors who met the qualifying criteria for the pardon would receive compensation. Only those who met the qualifying criteria. While others who lost their jobs, perhaps on the basis of an arrest rather than a conviction, or from being convicted for an offence which is out with the qualifying criteria, which I think we're getting close to agreeing, they would not receive compensation. You would set one minor or one minor's family against other uh, minors. The scheme could also be divisive between those who could show they qualified for the pardon and those who couldn't, perhaps because no remaining reference to a conviction could be found in any records. So I recognise that the uh, in intention uh, here is, is a good intention, and I agree with the, the principle of compensation. But it would be complex, it would be divisive, and I think it would be viewed by many people as unfair. It's also true to say that both employment uh, law and industrial relations are reserved to Westminster. Now, uh, Pam Duncan Glancy rightly mentions those aspects of the minor strike which have devolved and this Parliament has responsibility for, but there are very serious areas in which those are still reserved. So uh, employment, industrial relations, pensions, uh, these are reserved to Westminster and any Scottish Government to try to compensate or provide financial redress uh, to minors who were dismissed by the National Coal Board and lost out, for example, on redundancy payments and pension rights creates a risk of straying into that reservation and not being within uh, competence. One of the issues made by people like uh, Richard Leonard and others who support that point of view is that there was political interference in the strike, a commonly held view. We don't have the ability to go into the cabinet papers of the UK government or to call before us the National Coal Board if there are people still there that can uh, talk to that. Uh, so I think the reason uh, for uh, uh, saying that we will want to continue to press the UK government for a UK-wide public inquiry, we have to have regard to what miners in Wales would, would want to seek from this in the north of England as well. A compensation should be a properly thought-out, uniform, fair uh, system. Uh, if the compensation is for a miscarriage of justice, and don't forget we've agreed that we are not going back to look and second-guess what the courts did, whatever our view on it, that's the whole basis of the John Scott review, uh, uh, then it's not appropriate for the Scottish Government to make a payment which be effectively undermining judicial decisions of the past and preempting possibly decisions they've made uh, in the future. Those decisions are for the judiciary. So a huge sympathy with minors who have lost at least thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of pounds in redundancy and pension payments, which would have made a massive difference to them and their families. But it's not possible for me to support this amendment to create a compensation scheme because this bill is simply not the place uh, for it. And as I say, it would... Be regrettable if we are to divide, to divide either uh, it won't be today because there's not a vote here but as a parliament on this issue when i think there is so much uh, that we do uh, agree on um it, it wasn't proposed by the john scott's review and what what that independent review group did it was a carefully constructed set of proposals which took that into account 
and we've tried to take that forward. We have expanded it to include more people in that part. And it's a fine balance. I think it's the right balance, and it's for that reason that I wouldn't support that uh, amendment if it were to be voted on. Not that I would have a vote in this committee anyway, convener, but I wouldn't support it at that stage. Thank you. And I've now ask Richard Leonard to wind up for the group. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed, uh, convener. Well, <clears throat> just on the Cabinet Secretary's uh, points, if a compensation scheme will be so divisive and so difficult to do, how do you think Boris Johnson's going to be able to do it? Secondly, you mentioned about the Scott inquiry and the independent review. Uh, in, the Scott in, in the Scott report, it's clear that they are silent on it because it wasn't within their remit to consider it. Uh, amongst those attending today is Professor Jim Phillips from Glasgow University, who provided advice uh, to the Scott Review, and he is in favour of a compensation scheme. We know that Dennis Canavan, who's a, who was a member of the Scott Review, is in favour of a compensation scheme. And as I've alluded to earlier on, the NUM is in favour of a compensation scheme. They see this as an opportunity for this parliament to lead the way, not to be divisive, but to lead the way. And I would ask um, uh, the Cabinet Secretary and other members of the committee to uh, think on that. And I have to say that in his earlier remarks, the Cabinet Secretary said that as a student at Dundee University, he was in favour of the miners. Well, I would ask him to reflect on what that student would think now of you 38 years later as the Cabinet Secretary with the ability to financially redress the wrongs of that era. Surely the younger Keith Brown would have looked to the older Keith Brown to take action, to take divisive action and to go beyond uh, the symbolic pardon uh, which is in this legislation. So... Um, I am accused by some people of wanting to go uh, beyond the intentions uh, of the bill. Well, guilty as charged, because I do want this legislation to not just have a symbolic effect, but to have a moral effect, a practical effect, a financial effect, a meaningful effect. And I think that's what this parliament uh, should be aspiring to do. That's what this amendment uh, is intended to do. And... I say, as I said in the stage one debate to Fulton, McGregor and others, uh, if not now, when? If not us, who? The, um, the, uh, and I, and you know, the Cabinet Secretary uh, brought a degree of party politics into it. Well, I'm reminded that over the last few weeks, the First Minister has been riding round Scotland uh, in a bus, a campaign bus, with a, with a message on the side about sending a message to Boris. She said in a press interview, this election is an opportunity for people to send a message to Boris Johnson that they find his behaviour and response completely unacceptable. And she has previously said of the Prime Minister, who you are now looking at to provide a compensation scheme, truth is a disposable commodity to Boris Johnson. She called him corrupt and a liar. And that is who you're expecting this parliament to vest its faith in. But more than that, that is who you are asking the miners, the former miners, the miners' families, the mining communities to vest their faith in. Uh, well, I do not think uh, that's a credible argument uh, to pursue. Um, the, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned about other schemes uh, that have been uh, put in place, and I uh, take an interest in um, uh, financial and audit matters these days much more than I did previously. And if I look at the annual accounts of the Scottish Government, it, there is a note in there about the redress for survivors of historical child abuse uh, uh, cases, which was passed in March 2021 and received the Royal Assent on the 23rd of April 2021. And it goes on to say, and I quote, uh, Redress Scotland will consider applications and make determinations, which may include an offer of a redress payment to be made by the Scottish Government. It is not possible to determine the number of applicants or the level of payments likely to be made under the scheme. So it seems to me perfectly uh, reasonable uh, that we can agree to the principle of a scheme without getting to the point of being able to determine the number of applicants or indeed even the level of payments uh, likely uh, to be made. Um, I'll finish, Convener, uh, on this point. I mean, I do think that uh, we have an opportunity before us to set an example, to borrow the words of the National Union of Mine Workers, to take a lead. I think that we can be a beacon uh, to the rest of, of the UK. We can uh, take what I believe is an historic uh, opportunity. The strike ended 37 years ago. 
and all the pits have long since closed. And for new generations, this may seem like old history, but to those of us who lived through it, in coalfield communities, as I did, who were part of miners' support groups, who saw the strife and all of the uh, unrest and the difficulties that those communities faced and the hardships that were inflicted upon people by the justice system uh, of this uh, community, that will stay with them, that will stay with us, and that's why today is the time to open up the dialogue and the discussion about the establishment of a compensation scheme for the miners and their families. It, sir, could the audience please um, not participate um, in, in the gallery? Thank you. Um, so the question of Amendment 16 cannot be put in the absence of a financial resolution. So I now call Amendment 17 in the name of Richard Leonard, already debated with Amendment 2. Richard Leonard, to move or not move? Um, on the basis of what the Cabinet Secretary said earlier on, I'm happy not to press. Thank you. I now call Amendment 5 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 2. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, that, that is agreed. The question, therefore, is that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Call Amendment 18 in the name of Richard Leonard, already debated with Amendment 16. Richard Leonard to move formally. It's a consequential convener of the yeah. amendment which we are not voting on. Thank you. So the question then is that, that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. I call Amendment 13 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 1. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? No. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is not agreed. Those voting in favour of Amendment 13, please raise your hands. That's one vote. Those against? And that is six votes. I therefore call Amendment 6 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already, already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Palm Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 1. Palm Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 14 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? That is not agreed. All those in favour? One vote. And those against? Six. Thank you. The question is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. The question is that Section 5 and 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Call Amendment 8 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. That ends Stage 2 consideration of the Bill. I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for their attendance. And this concludes our meeting. Thank you.